All right, now solving polynomial uh, equations, great fun, lots of interest. You want to bring everything over to one side, have it equal to zero, and then factor away. Solving polynomial inequalities raises it up a notch. That's right. We're going to add a little zing to our equations and look at inequalities. Turns out it's the exact same principle, except that it's a little bit more subtle because instead of having something equal to zero, we're going to have something that's either greater than or less than or greater than or equal to or less than or equal to zero. And when that happens, all of a sudden there are lots of cases because there's lots of ways for factors to be greater than zero. A product can be greater than zero because they're both positive or they're both negative. A product can be less than zero because one's positive and one's negative, or the other one's positive and the other one's negative. So there's lots of cases. But once you kind of think about it, you'll see it's not a big deal. Let's take a look at an example and have some fun together. Here's a cubic inequality I want us to consider. x cubed plus x squared is greater than 25x plus 25. OK, and I want us to solve this inequality which means I want to find all the values for x which make this inequality true, make this inequality hold. So where do I start? Well, just think about it. If you want like a polynomial equation, the same kind of procedure applies. So I want to get everything to one side, come all over to my house, and I want to have the thing equal to 0 on the other side. And so I'm going to have an inequality that's going to have all the stuff on one side, inequality symbol, 0 on the other. Let's check it out. So what am I going to do? I'll bring everything over to the left-hand side, and I'm going to write x cubed. I like writing the highest power up front, plus x squared. And then if I subtract 25x from both sides, the inequality doesn't change. So I have minus 25x. And if I subtract this 25 on both sides, I see it comes over as minus 25. But since I subtracted 25x and I subtracted 25 from the right-hand side, this is now greater than 0. So notice there's the, the magic 0. So this whole number, whatever it is, has to be positive. If I could factor this, we know something. The only way that two numbers can, or more, can actually multiply to, to be something that's positive is either they're all positive or I have an even number of them negative. And so that's what I have to consider, lots of cases. So first is this factoring. So let's just get down to factoring here. Now, how do you factor? It's a cubic. Oh my goodness, this is so scary. What do you do? Let me tell you how I do this, OK? I'm going to be honest with you. First of all, these things tend to be factorable. Otherwise, the teacher wouldn't be so mean to ask us. So now we have to kind of think about what do you see. So look for patterns. If there were a common factor of x everywhere, that's the first thing I would have done was pull out that x. But sadly, there's a constant term, negative 25. That really ticks me off. So I'm in trouble there. But wait a minute, there's a 25 here. Now that's a coincidence. There's two 25s here. And notice that actually here, I can factor out not only just x, but I can factor out x squared. So I'm going to see what happens if I factor out an x squared here. Let's just try that. And by the way, you're not going to always get it right the first time out. That's totally fine. Just out of these two terms, if I take out an x squared from the x cubed, I owe you an x. And if I take out an x squared from here, I got it all, but I got to put in the 1 to make sure I get it back. Interesting, because check it out. If I were to factor out a 25 here, it would kind of look like an x plus 1, but those negative signs get in the way. Let me factor out a negative 25. So check it out. Let's pull out a negative 25 from what's left. If I pull out a negative 25 from this, I'm just left with that x. And if I factor out a negative 25 from here, I just have to put in a plus 1 to make sure I get it back. And now I've done something here. It's not quite factored yet. But notice that I've now factored part of it and factored part of it. And I've got these things. And check it out. These guys are the same. So this is actually a factor by grouping little procedure here, because check out that that's a factor here, and this is a factor here. So I could suck that right out of both of them. And that's the way I'm going to factor this crazy thing. So you got to think of all sorts of little teeny tricks when you're trying to factor. Look for patterns. Always look for patterns. I'm going to suck that right out. So I have the x plus 1 times, and then what am I left with here? Just an x squared. And then here I'm left with the minus 25. So that's awesome, because now it's factored. But just like a potato chip, once you have one, you can't stop. 
check it out. That's the difference of two perfect squares. I can actually factor that a little more. So I'm going to factor this all the way down until I really don't know how to factor anymore or it can't be factored anymore. So this is x plus 5 times x minus 5. And that is now fully factored. All these terms are just little linear terms. I've got three terms. So I've got three numbers multiplying to give us something that's positive. And now what do I do? Well, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to find out where, in fact, I get a solution where these three terms actually uh, produce 0. So I'm going to first find out where, in fact, this uh, e corresponding equation, if I put an equal sign there, would yield 0. And those are going to tell me the points that I want to kind of look around. See? Because that's going to give me 0. I don't want 0. I want stuff that's around 0 on one side of it, right? I want something a little bit bigger than 0. So first, let's find out where they are 0. Well, this is 0 when x equals negative 1. This is 0 when x equals negative 5. And this is 0 when x equals 5. Now, what I want us to do is think about a little, a little um, number line. Because we have to kind of visualize this. This is going to get a little bit fun. I think you're going to enjoy this. So let's put a little number line together, a little number line action. Here we go. Look at that. And I'm going to, and, and now, now I'm going to talk to you like an adult. Because you could put the number lines in, you know, and put in 0, 1, 2, 3, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and so forth. I'm not even going to do that. I'm just going to mark in the points that I care about, which in this case, negative 1, negative 5, and 5. So I have to write them in the right order. Smallest one is negative 5. Then the next largest one is negative 1. I'm not even drawing it to scale necessarily. And then the last one is 5. See how I just marked off those points in order? Because check it out. What I know is that at these values, this polynomial equals 0. And I'm going to denote that by actually putting in a little 0 on top that tells me the polynomial is 0 there. And so now what's going to... What this tells me is that on these intervals, this interval right here, this interval right here, this interval right here, and this interval here, the, the, the interval between these values, that's where the sign of this will either be positive or negative. And all we have to do is determine whether it's positive or negative, and then we know if we want to include all of those numbers to be solutions or not. So what I'm saying is I'm taking the real number line and I'm cutting it up into, into this case, one, two, three, four pieces. And with those four pieces, I have to consider each of those intervals together. And I'll see which ones produce a positive and which ones produce a negative, And I'm looking for the positive. So the way to think about this is to uh, consider these various test intervals. And how do I write them? Well, I'm looking for all the people that are in this range right here. And you know how I write that? <clears throat> I say, well, you can go to the far left as you want. So I'm going to say it's from negative infinity. That's the way of saying all the way up to negative 5. And since I am looking at values where I want the thing to be strictly greater than 0, then I am not going to include the negative 5. So these parentheses, these round parentheses, means don't include. Just look up to, but don't touch. You can get as close as you want, but don't touch negative 5, because I know it's 0 there. That's not an answer. I want it to be positive. And of course, you can never touch negative infinity, so I always put these parentheses like that around infinity or negative infinity. Then I have to consider this interval. That's the interval between negative 5 and negative 1. And again, I know the value of that factored thing is 0 at both those endpoints. I'm only looking for positive, and so I'm going to want to put open parentheses everywhere there. Now I consider this interval. That's from negative 1 to 5, and again, open parentheses. And then finally, from 5 to infinity and beyond. So I write that like this. And again, infinity always gets an open, but in this case, the 5 gets an open because, in fact, that I know it equals 0 there. All right. Now, what do I do to see if these intervals are really solutions or not? All you have to do is just pick a particular x value that's in that particular interval and plug it in to what we have, namely into this thing. 
And if the answer is positive, then we're, we're good to go. And if, and if not, then we're not good to go. So let's just try it here. So the way that I do it is I, I look at this thing, and you plug in a number. So you can pick any number you want. There's no rhyme or reason. You can pick it small. You can pick it large, whatever you want. It just has to be smaller than negative 5. Let's say negative 6. So if I plug in negative 6 here <clears throat> for x, negative 6 plus 1, you can figure out that it's negative 5. But I don't even care about that. All I care about is the sign. So is it positive or negative? Well, negative 6 plus 1 is certainly negative. And what about when I plug in negative 6 into here? Negative 6 plus 5, well, we know it's negative 1. But I don't care about that. I just care about if it's positive or negative. It's negative. And then finally, I'm multiplying that by negative 6 minus 5. And what's negative 6 minus 5? Well, all I care about is it, is it positive or negative, and it's negative. And now what's a negative times a negative times a negative? Well, negative times a negative is a positive, times a negative is a negative. So it's negative there. Now we're looking for positive solutions, which means, in fact, this is not going to be an interval of solution. And now we continue throughout the whole rest of this thing. So for example, here, between negative 1 and negative 5, I'll pick negative uh, 2. Uh, negative 2 will make this negative. Negative 2 will make this positive. And negative 2 will make this negative. So a negative times a positive is a negative times a negative is a positive. So in fact, this is a positive range, which means that everything in there is going to be a solution to this inequality. Cool. You see how we're doing it? We're kind of blocking it out. Between negative 1 and 5, it's always fun when you come across this interval because 0 is in there. Wherever 0 is, that's, I always pick 0 in that in, whenever I can because that's positive. Again, I'm plugging in for x, 0. So that's 1. This is 5, and that's negative 5. So it's positive, positive negative. And what's a positive times a positive times a negative? That is a negative. We don't care about that. We're looking for positive. And finally, uh, bigger than 5, let's pick, let's say, 6. 6 plus 1 is positive. 6 plus 5 is positive. 6 minus 5 is positive. So I've got a positive times a positive times a positive. That's a positive. And that gives me everything now. That's the answer to the whole thing, because what's the solution? The solution is going to be wherever it's positive, which is this interval together with that interval. And how do you write that? The way you write that, turns out, is kind of cool, because you could write it this way. You could say it's the interval negative 5 to negative 1 union, which means you know that, together with uh, this one, 5 to infinity. So that's the way you'd express the answer. Now, let me just say qu two quick words here. Suppose that the inequality actually was like this, where, in fact, now I want the thing to be negative. Well, then we do the exact same work, and we just ask, OK, well, where, in fact, uh, are the intervals for which this thing is negative. And you see it's here and here. So then I would write um, negative infinity to negative 5 with parentheses union negative 1 to 5. Again, with parentheses because I want it to be strictly negative. Okay? And one last example, just for fun. What happens if, in fact, the inequality was less than or equal to 0? And this was the case we haven't looked at yet. Now you're also allowing the possibility to equal 0. How is that going to change things? Well, the way it's going to change things is you're now allowed to equal those little endpoints where you had the zeros. So in fact, the solution to this, I can read off this chart, is the following. It's wherever it's negative, which is here and here. But now, wherever it's 0, at negative 5, at negative 1, and at 5, those are allowable. And the way we write that is with a closed parentheses. So I write negative infinity to negative 5. But now notice I'm putting a kind of a bracket, a sharp bracket. That means you lasso that point. That point is in there. And I'm going to union that with this, where I'm allowed to equal negative 1 and I'm allowed to equal 5. So I put these sharp brackets to mean I can include them because I'm allowed to equal 0. Notice the negative infinity and also the positive infinity, they will never have a closed bracket because infinity is not a number. So they're always open there, but you could close these, in fact, if you're allowed to equal 0. Wow. So that's actually how you think about solving polynomial inequalities. Get everything over to one side, 
so it equals zero, factor away, kind of solve it for zero to get candidates of where things are going to change, and then set up a table and look for the sign in those various intervals. And depending upon whether you're allowed to equal zero or not, you include various endpoints of those intervals or not. Just checking away allows you to divide the real number into just a finite collection of pieces, each of which can be checked, enjoyed, and all of a sudden, voila, you have your solution. I'll see you soon.